All right, those of you expecting to hear me speak in tongues this morning, I apologize. <laughs> that is not the emphasis of the sermon. Uh, not that I could do it. <laughs> it's not my gift. Um, and if anyone would like to come up here, because it may sound like I'm speaking in tongues when I get to these uh, names in the middle part of the scripture, if anyone else would like to volunteer to read that instead of me, I didn't figure. Okay, here are these words from Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and the tongue rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they said, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds and power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneers and sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the men of Judea. And all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, and those I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Let us pray. O God, send forth your spirit with wind and fire and renew the face of the earth. Dwell among us, even though your presence may startle and unsettle us. Grant us your peace, we pray, as justice and love pour down upon the yearning earth. Amen. Fire has long been re represented by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, if I took a piece of paper and put it down here in this candle down below, you could see the power of fire because I wouldn't be able to contain it. You look at back at all the stories in the Bible, and when Moses was tending his father-in-law's sheep, he saw an amazing sight. There was a bush on fire, yet not consumed. And as he approached this unusual sight, he heard Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. Then the voice 
who Moses later discovered to be God's voice, said, Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for you are on holy ground. Out of fire, out of a burning bush, God called Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. Lead them to the promised land. Then, later, as Moses and the Israelites made their way across the wilderness in the promised land, and they were there for 40 years. During the day, God was with them in the form of a pillar of cloud, but at night, God led them by a pillar of fire. The fire was so bright that they could see to travel at night. And then one of my favorite stories in the Bible is of this prophet Elijah and his duel with the prophets of the god Baal. Many of the Israelites have begun worshiping the false god, and in an act of boldness, Elijah challenges their prophets to a test, one god against another. Two altars prepared, two bulls were slaughtered and placed on the altars, and the prophets of Baal began to call upon their god, dancing around the altar, praying that their god would bring down fire from heaven and consume their offering. And this went on for a better part of a day. And Elijah was, of course, being the person of great respect, taunted them the whole time. <laughs> Perhaps your God's taking a nap or make me a potty break. Elijah was unrelenting in his verbal assault. And finally, he turned to the altar that had been built for, for Yahweh, for his God, for the God of Israel. And he ordered 10 gallons of water be poured on it. poured over the altar, poured over the wood, poured over the sacrifice, and then he prayed God would show power. And as he prayed, fire, they say, the fire of the Lord fell and burned up not only the sacrifice, but the wood, the stones, the soil, the altar. Everything consumed. So it's fitting that we experience our text today we experience the power of God coming with fire, blown in on the wind by the breath of God as fire. Imagine it. The day of Pentecost, the disciples are all together praying in one room and worshiping God. Let's face it, they're still a little scared. They haven't seen Jesus for a little while now. He told them to wait, but they weren't out and about. So suddenly, they're in this room, and the sound that must have been of the violent wind that blew through a closed room. Now imagine that. We've all experienced the Oklahoma wind. You know, you're driving along and it nearly blows you off the road. But imagine sitting and having that wind in a closed room. The sound fills the whole house, and they see fire, like tongues of fire coming out of the wind and resting on each one. This has to be scary. This isn't something that you, you know, just your ordinary every day, oh, look at that. This fire comes and rests on each of them. They are filled with the Spirit, and they begin to speak in other languages. And they're so excited, they take to the streets. And they leave the room, and they're out in the streets beginning to preach the good news to the people who had gathered from all over the world because the fear is gone. Fire is a good illustration of God's Spirit. Fire cannot help but remind us of God's power. You've heard tales of the old locomotive trains and the furnace, and they stoke it with wood or with coal and throws it in, and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and more and more energy, and fire produces power. And that's what happened that day. Fire reminds us that God is so powerful that God just said a word and the world came into being. 
What was that word? Let there be light. And we know the sun, the light, is a ball of fire. Can never confuse God's power with that of a flickering candle. It's more like a raging inferno. Now, we, I put a candle on the table this morning to remind us of that flame so we can see that flame. And it's a visual aid to remind us of God's presence with us. But we have to remember that fire is the holiness of God. Fire is not something we take lightly. We teach our children early on that fire is not something that you play with. It's something to be respected. If you don't use fire appropriately, if, or if you misuse it, it can cause pain. Fire for the Christian can symbolize enthusiasm and joy and happiness. And as we read on this day of Pentecost, we not, cannot help to sen but sense the enthusiasm that the disciples felt. One moment they're hiding and the next they can't contain themselves. No longer behind closed doors. They have to share what they experienced. What's that term we use? People are on fire. What about we go to a football game and there's a group of cheerleaders and they're screaming and doing flips in order to get us fired up. Are we fired up about following Jesus Christ? It is important for us to realize that a fire, if it's not tended, will go out. same is true of our Christian joy. The same is true of our activity of faith. If we don't stoke the fire, it just burns itself out. Sometimes it seems like churches are filled with people who used to be excited about their faith, but they're, yeah, it fades. The fire goes out. You've heard the term burnout. The idea that someone had been enthused about what they were doing and suddenly loses the joy and excitement. I think we have a lot of followers of Christ who have had spiritual burnout over the years. But I think the reason for that is forgetting, concentrating on what we're doing and forgetting why we do it. There's a story about two persons, and they're standing out in front of this large church which is burning to the ground. And one guy says to the other guy, I think this is the first time I've ever seen you at church. And he says, well, this is the first time I've ever seen the church on fire. <laughs> yeah, it's a little punny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jeff's booing me up here. But we have to remember why we're doing the things that we do. We must not take our eyes off of the fact that we are followers of Jesus. We have to listen for his calling for mission and ministry. When we take our eyes off Christ's calling for us, when we forget why we're doing it, we find our energy waning and the fire begins to fade. Sometimes this occurs subtly, and other times because we douse it. Then the winter, any of you like to have a fireplace in the winter? I remember when we were growing up, and Dad and Lois had this wood-burning stove in the basement. And at night, we would go down, and we would stoke it with a bunch of wood before we went to bed and pray that it still had embers in the morning. It's a whole lot easier to keep a fire going than it is to start one. You spend a great deal of time stoking a fire and you place wood on the flames and give it the wind and the gentle breeze that it needs 
so it can catch and be more and more. But a fire has to be fed to keep growing. And the same is true of our spiritual life. We must feed the things it needs to keep it going and to help it grow. What are the things we need to do to feed our spiritual fire? What are those pieces of kindling that keeps our fire alive? Look at the, look at the early church. The fire that was in them did not go out after the day of Pentecost. Acts 2.42 reads, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. We have to spend our time in prayer with one another. Not simply telling God what we want, but listening for God's call on our lives and on our congregation. We need to read scripture, reading it for what it has to say for us in the 21st century. That's one of the things I'm so excited about, about what we're doing on Wednesday nights right now, is we're looking at these scriptures and saying, what is this saying to us today? We have to spend time together knowing that we are on a journey of faith together. None of us are alone. If one person is feeling burnt out. It takes others to come with them and to help them experience the faith and to rekindle the fire. We've got to focus on the positive things of God's world and keep the fire burning. One of his letters to a young preacher named Timothy, Paul encouraged him to stir up the gift that is within him. Perhaps our sense is that our fire is not what it used to be or what we want it to be. Then maybe we need to stir up the fire a little bit, poke at it a little bit, allow the sweet wind of the Holy Spirit to give oxygen to the flame. I will say that I think the spiritual flame at this congregation is alive and well. We just haven't let anybody know about it. Do other people know what's going on with the wind and the fire of the Holy Spirit that's blowing through First Christian Church of Oklahoma City? Are we known for tra a transforming center in our community? Are we doing things with such enthusiasm and energy that the naysayers might even comment, are those people full of new wine? If we don't make space for the wind and fire of the Holy Spirit to blow through our lives and the life of our congregation, then our words and our actions are empty. But undergirded by the Spirit, we can rise above all the jumbled mess with the message of a savior, a message of love, a message of hope for all people. I'm afraid it's little easy for us to talk about, Jeff talked about Easter, people thinking it's a one day thing and every day is Easter day. Well, I'm here to tell you that every day is Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came in the rush of wind and tongues of flame and thousands of people were converted. But if nothing else, the book of Acts is a strong testimony that the Holy Spirit did not end with that day. We know the need for the power of the Spirit. We know that nothing can change this world except for an intrusion into it of excitement and power. Pentecost challenges us to live into the promise that Christ is always present, always alive, always active in our world. There was a praise song that came familiar, uh, popular a few years back, and there was a bridge in it that said, we've been through fire, we've been through rain, 
We've been refined by the power of your name. We've fallen deeper in love with you. You've burned the truth on our lips. As we celebrate Pentecost, I pray that like those first believers, we will be refined by the power of the tongues of fire and the power of the Holy Spirit that moves through us. If we will just be open to the movement of the Spirit around us, I want people to stand up and take notice and say maybe they are filled with new wine. I mean, truthfully, some people do. The bicycle ministry, a ministry for homeless people, people thought we were crazy when we said we were going to start it, and I'm talking about people in this congregation. Jeff was one of them. (laughs) But we are known in the community as the church that gives transportation, even though they thought we were crazy. They're noticing what God can do to transform. But are we telling anybody about it? We've got to let people understand that the Spirit is burning here at First Christian Church. The great and good news of of Pentecost is that God is still busy in our world. Each of us has a choice. We can either continue about our way and simply put a part of everyday mess in the muddle of life and just kind of live with what it is or undergirded by the power of the Spirit. We can join together in God's work and share the good news of a risen Savior. If the task is a bit overwhelming, just remember the story of Pentecost. For the heights and depths no words can reach, God gave us his very Spirit, the soul's own speech. We are being empowered by wind and fire. I'm absolutely sure of it. We, like Moses, are called by the one who burns and burns with boundless energy but does not consume. We, like the first apostles, are touched by the one who comes like tongues of fire, empowering us to love one another. Here, today, in this place, feel the power of the wind-driven fire, the spirit of the living God. Oh God, melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on each of us. Amen.